G.K. Chesterton's Charles Dickens, Chapter 4 The Pickwick Papers Round the birth of Pickwick broke one of those literary quarrels that were too common in the life of Dickens. Such quarrels indeed generally arose from some definite mistake or misdemeanor on the part of somebody else, but they were also made possible by an indefinite touchiness and susceptibility in Dickens himself. He was so sensitive on points of personal authorship that even his sacred sense of humor deserted him. He turned people into mortal enemies whom he might have turned very easily into immortal jokes. It was not that he was lawless. In a sense, it was that he was too legal. But he did not understand the principle of de minimis non curat lex. Anybody could draw him. Any fool could make a fool of him. Any obscure madman who chose to say that he had written the whole of Martin Chuzzlewit's, any penny a liner who chose to say that Dickens wore no shirt collar, could call forth the most passionate and public denials, as of a man pleading not guilty to witchcraft or high treason. Hence the letters of Dickens are filled with a certain singular type of quarrels and complaints, quarrels and complaints in which one cannot say that he was on the wrong side, but that merely even in being on the right side he was in the wrong place. He was not only a generous man, he was even a just man. To have made against anybody a charge or claim which was unfair would have been unsupportable to him. His weakness was that he found the unfair claim or charge, however small, equally unsupportable when brought against himself. No one can say of him that he was often wrong. We can only say of him, as of many pugnacious people, that he was too often right. The incidents attending the inauguration of the Pickwick Papers are not, perhaps, a perfect example of this trait, because Dickens was here a hand-to-mouth journalist, and the blow might possibly have been more disabling than those struck at him in his days of triumph. But all through those days of triumph, and to the end of his death, Dickens took this old tea-cup tempest with the most terrible gravity, drew up declarations, called witnesses, preserved pulverizing documents, and handed on to his children the forgotten folly as if it had been a highland feud. Yet the unjust claim made on him was so much more ridiculous even than it was unjust, that it seemed strange that he should have remembered it for a month except for his amusement. The facts are simple and familiar to most people. The publishers, Chapman and Hall, wished to produce some kind of serial with comic illustrations by a popular caricaturist named Seymour. This artist was chiefly famous for his running of the farcical side of sport, and to suit his specialty it was very vaguely suggested to Dickens by the publishers that he should write about a Nimrod club, or some such thing, a club of amateur sportsmen foredoomed to perpetual ignominies. Dickens objected in substance upon two very sensible grounds. First, that sporting sketches were stale, and second, that he knew nothing about sport. He changed the idea to that of a general club for travel and investigation, the Pickwick Club, and only retained one fatal sportsman, Mr. Winkle, the melancholy remnant of the Nimrod Club that never was. The first seven pictures appeared with the signature of Seymour and the letterpress of Dickens, and in them Winkle and his woes were fairly, but not extraordinarily, prominent. Before the eighth picture appeared, Seymour had blown his brains out. After a brief interval of the employment of a man named Buss, Dickens obtained the assistance of Hablet K. Brown, whom he called Fizz, and may almost, in a certain sense, be said to have gone into partnership with him. They were as suited to each other, and to the common creation of a unique thing as Gilbert and Sullivan. No other illustrator ever created the true Dickens characters with the precise and correct quantum of exaggeration. No other illustrator ever breathed the true Dickens atmosphere, in which clerks are clerks, and yet at the same time elves. To the tame mind, the above affair does not seem to offer anything very promising in the way of a row, but Seymour's widow managed to evolve it out of it the proposition that somehow or another her husband had written Pickwick, or at least had been responsible for the genius and success of it. It does not appear that she had anything at all resembling a reason for this opinion except the unquestionable fact that the publishers had started with the idea of employing Seymour. This was quite true, and Dickens, who over and above his honesty was far too quarrelsome a man not to try and keep in the right, and who showed a sort of fierce carefulness in telling the truth in such cases, never denied it or attempted to conceal it. It was quite true that at the beginning, instead of Seymour being employed to illustrate Dickens, Dickens may have said to have been employed to illustrate Seymour. 
but that Seymour invented anything in the letterpress, large or small, that he invented either the outline of Mr. Pickwick's character, or the number of Mr. Pickwick's cabman, that he invented either the story, or so much as a semicolon in the story, was not only never proved, but was never very lucidly alleged. Dickens fills his letters with all that there is to be said against Mrs. Seymour's idea. It is not very clear whether there was anything definitely said for it. Upon the mere superficial fact and law of the affair, Dickens ought to have been superior to this silly business. But in a much deeper and a much more real sense, he ought to have been superior to it. It did not really touch him or his greatness at all, even as an abstract allegation. If Seymour had started the story, had provided Dickens with his puppets, Tupman or Jingle, Dickens would still have been Dickens and Seymour only Seymour. As a matter of fact, it happened to be a contemptible lie, but it would have been an equally contemptible truth, for the fact is that the greatness of Dickens, and especially the greatness of Pickwick, is not of a kind that could be affected by somebody else suggesting the first idea. It could not be affected by somebody else writing the first chapter. If it could be shown that another man had suggested to Hawthorne, let us say, the primary conception of the scarlet letter, Hawthorne, who worked it out, would still be an exquisite workman, but he would be by so much less a creator. But in a case like Pickwick, there is a simple test. If Seymour gave Dickens the main idea of Pickwick, what was it? There is no primary conception of Pickwick for anyone to suggest. Dickens not only did not get the general plan from Seymour, he did not get it at all. In Pickwick, and indeed in Dickens, generally it is in the details that the author is creative. It is in the details that he is vast. The power of the book lies in the perceptual torrent of ingenious and inventive treatment. The theme, at least at the beginning, simply does not exist. The idea of Tupman, the fat lady killer, is in itself quite dreary and vulgar. It is the detailed Tupman, as he is developed, who is unexpectedly amusing. The idea of Winkle, the clumsy sportsman, is in itself quite stale. It is as he goes on repeating himself that he becomes original. We hear of men whose imagination can touch with magic the dull facts of our life. But Dickens's yet more indomitable fancy could touch with magic even our dull fiction. Before we are halfway through the book, the stock characters of dead and damned forces astonish us like splendid strangers. Seymour's claim, then, viewed symbolically, was even a compliment. It was true in spirit that Dickens obtained, or might have obtained, the start of Pickwick from somebody else, from anybody else. For he had a more gigantic energy than the energy of the intense artist, the energy which is prepared to write something. He had the energy which is prepared to write anything. He could have finished any man's tale. He could have breathed a mad life into any man's characters. If it had been true that Seymour had planned out Pickwick, if Seymour had fixed the chapters and named and numbered the characters, his slave would have shown even in these shackles such a freedom as would have shaken the world. If Dickens had been forced to make his instance out of a chapter in a child's reading book, or the names in a scrap of newspaper, he would have turned them in ten pages into creatures of his own. Seymour, as I say, was in a manner right in spirit. Dickens would at this time get his materials from anywhere, in the sense that he cared little what materials they were. He would not have stolen, but if he had stolen, he would never have imitated. The power which he proceeded at once to exhibit was the one power in letters which literally cannot be imitated the primary, inexhaustible creative energy, the enormous prodigality of genius, which no one but another genius could parody. To claim to have originated an idea of Dickens is like claiming to have contributed one glass of water to Niagara. Wherever this stream or that stream started, the colossal cataract of absurdity went roaring night and day. The volume of his invention overwhelmed all doubt of his inventiveness. Dickens was evidently a great man, unless he was a thousand man. The actual circumstances of the writing and publishing of Pickwick shows that while Seymour's specific claim was absurd, Dickens' indignant exactitude about every jot and title of authorship was also inappropriate and misleading. The Pickwick papers, when all is said and done, 
did emerge out of a haze of suggestions and proposals in which more than one person was involved. The publishers failed to base the story on a Nimrod club, but they succeeded in basing it on a club. Seymour, by his virtue of idiosyncrasy, if he did not create, brought about the creation of Mr. Winkle. Seymour sketched Mr. Pickwick as a tall, thin man. Mr. Chapman, apparently without any word from Dickens, boldly turned him into a short, fat man. Chapman took the type from a corpulent old dandy named Foster, who wore tights and gaiters and lived at Richmond. In this sense, we were affected by this idle aspect of the thing. We might call Chapman the real originator of Pickwick. But as I have suggested, originating Pickwick is not the point. It was quite easy to originate Pickwick. The difficulty was to write it. However such things may be, there can be no question of the result of this chaos. In the Pickwick papers, Dickens sprang suddenly from a comparatively low level to a very high one, to the levels of sketches by Boz. He never afterwards descended. To the level of the Pickwick papers, it is doubtful if he ever afterwards rose. Pickwick, indeed, is not a good novel, but is not a bad novel, for it is not a novel at all. In one sense, indeed, it is something nobler than a novel, for no novel with a plot and a proper termination can emit that sense of everlasting youth, a sense as of the gods gone wandering in England. This is not a novel, for all novels have an end, and Pickwick, properly speaking, has no end. He is equal unto the angels, the point at which, as a fact, we find the printer matter terminates is not an end in any artistic sense of the word. Even as a boy I believe there was some more pages that were torn out of my copy, and I am looking for them still. The book might have been cut short anywhere else. It might have been cut short after Mr. Pickwick was released by Mr. Nupkins, or after Mr. Pickwick was fished out of the water, or at a hundred other places. And we should still have known that this was not really the story's end. We should have known that Mr. Pickwick was still having the same high adventures on the same high roads. As it happens, the book ends after Mr. Pickwick has taken a house in the neighborhood of Dulwich. But we know he did not stop there. We know he broke out, that he took again the road of the high adventures. We know that if we take it ourselves in any acre of England, we may come suddenly upon him in a lane. But this relation of Pickwick to the strict form of fiction demands a further word, which should indeed be said in any case before the consideration of any or all of the Dickens' tales. Dickens's work is not to be reckoned in any novels at all. Dickens's work is to be reckoned always by characters, sometimes by groups, oftener by episodes, but never by novels. You cannot discuss whether Nicholas Nickleby is a good novel, or whether Our Mutual Friend is a bad novel. Strictly, there is no such novel as Nicholas Nickleby. There is no such novel as Our Mutual Friend. They are simply links cut from the following and mixed substance called Dickens, a substance of which any given length will be certain to contain a given proportion of brilliant or of bad stuff. You can say, according to your assumptions, the Crummel's part is perfect, or the Boffins are a mistake. Just as a man watching a river go by him could count here a floating flower, and then a streak of scum. But you cannot artistically divide the outpost into two books. The best of his work can be found in the worst of his works. The Tale of Two Cities is a good novel. Little Dora is not a good novel. But the description of the circumlocution office in Little Dorrit is quite as good as the description of Telson's bank in The Tale of Two Cities. The old curiosity shop is not so good as David Copperfield, but Swiveller is quite as good as Micawber. Nor is there any reason why the superb creatures, as a general rule, should be in one novel any more than the other. There is no reason why Sam Weller, in the course of his wanderings, should not wander into Nicholas Nickleby. There is no reason why Major Bagstock, in his brisk way, should not walk straight out of Dombey and Son and straight into Martin Chuzzlewit. To this generalization, some modification should be added. Pickwick stands by itself, and has even a sort of unity, and not pretending to unity. David Copperfield, in a less degree, stands by itself, as being the only book in which Dickens wrote of himself, 
and The Tale of Two Cities stand by itself as being the only book in which Dickens slightly altered himself. But as a whole, this should be firmly grasped that the units of Dickens, the primary elements, are not the stories, but the characters who affect the stories, or more often still, the characters who do not affect the stories. This is a plain matter, but, unless it be stated and felt, Dickens may be greatly misunderstood and greatly underrated. For not only is his whole machinery directed to facilitating the self-display of certain characters, but something more deep and more unmodern still is also true of him. It is also true that all the moving machinery exists only to display entirely static character. Things in the Dickens story shift and change only in order to give us glimpses of great characters that do not change at all. If we had a sequel of Pickwick ten years afterwards, Pickwick would be exactly the same age. We know he would not have fallen into that strange and beautiful second childhood which soothed and simplified the end of Colonel Newcomb. Newcomb, throughout the book, is in an atmosphere of time. Pickwick, throughout the book, is not. This will probably be taken by most modern people as praise of Thackeray and dispraise of Dickens. But this only shows how few modern people understand Dickens. It also shows how few understand the faiths and the fables of mankind. The matter can only be roughly stated in one way. Dickens did not strictly make a literature, he made a mythology. For a few years our corner of Western Europe has had a fancy for this thing we call fiction, that is, for writing down our own lives or similar lives in order to look at them. But though we call it fiction, it differs from older literatures chiefly in being less fictitious. It imitates not only life, but the limitations of life and not only reproduces life, it reproduces death. But outside us, in every other country, in every other age, there has been going on from the beginning a more fictitious kind of fiction. I mean the kind now called folklore, the literature of the people. Our modern novels, which deal with men as they are, are truly produced by a small and educated section of society. But this other literature deals with men greater than they are, with demigods and heroes. And that is far too important a matter to be trusted to the educated classes. The fashioning of these portents is a popular trade, like ploughing or bricklaying. The men who made hedges, the men who made ditches were the men who made deities. Men could not elect their kings, but they could elect their gods. So we find ourselves faced with a fundamental contrast between what is called fiction and what is called folklore. The one exhibits an abnormal degree of dexterity operating within our daily limitations. The other exhibits quite normal desires extended beyond those limitations. Fiction means the common things are seen by the uncommon people. Fairy tales mean the uncommon things as seen by the common people. As our world advances through history, towards its present epoch, it becomes more specialist, less democratic, and folklore turns gradually into fiction. But it is only slowly that the old elfin fire fades into the light of common realism. For ages after our characters have dressed up in the clothes of mortals, they betray the blood of the gods. Even our phraseology is full of relics of this. When a modern novel is devoted to the bewilderment of a weak young clerk who cannot decide which woman he wants to marry, or which new religion he believes in, we still give this knock-kneed cad the name of the hero, the name which is the crown of Achilles. The popular preference for a story with a happy ending is not, or at least was not, a mere sweet-stuff optimism. It is the remains of the old idea of the triumph of the dragon-slayer, the ultimate hypothesis of the man beloved of heaven. But there is another and more intangible trace of this fading supernaturalism, a trace very vivid to the reader, but very elusive to the critic. It is a certain air of endlessness in the episodes even in the shortest episodes, a sense that, although we leave them, they still go on. Our modern attraction to short stories is not an accident of form. 
It is the sign of a real sense of fleetingness and frugality. It means that existence is only an impression, or perhaps only an illusion. A short story of today has the air of a dream. It has the irrevocable beauty of a falsehood. We get a glimpse of great streets of London or red plains of India, as in an opium vision we see people, arresting people with fiery and appealing faces. But when the story is ended, the people are ended. We have no instinct of anything ultimate and enduring behind these episodes. The moderns, in a word, describe life in short stories because they are possessed with the sentiment that life itself is an uncommonly short story, and perhaps not a true one. But in this elder literature, even in the comic literature, indeed especially in the comic literature, the reverse is true. The characters are felt to be fixed things of which we have fleeting glimpses, that is, they are felt to be divine. Uncle Toby is talking forever, as the elves are dancing forever. We feel that whenever we hammer on the house of Falstaff, Falstaff will be at home. We feel it has a pagan would feel that, if a cry broke the silence after ages of unbelief, Apollo would still be listening in his temple. These writers may tell short stories, but we feel they are only parts of a long story. And herein lies the particular significance, the particular sacredness even, of penny dreadfuls and the common printed matter made for our errand boys. Here in dim and desperate forms under the ban of our base culture, stormed at by silly magistrates, sneered at by silly schoolmasters, here is the old popular literature still popular. Here is the unmistakable voluminousness, the thousand and one tales of Dick Deadshot, like the thousand and one tales of Robin Hood. Here is the splendid and static boy, the boy who remains a boy through a thousand volumes and a thousand years. Here, in mean alleys and dim shops, shadowed and shamed by the police, mankind is still driving its dark trade in heroes. And elsewhere, and in all other ages, in braver fashion, under cleaner skies, the same eternal tale-telling goes on, and the whole mortal world is a factory of immortals. Dickens was a mythologist rather than a novelist. He was the last of the mythologists, and perhaps the greatest. He did not always manage to make his characters men, but he always managed at the least to make them gods. They are creatures like Punch or Father Christmas. They live statically in a perpetual summer of being themselves. It is not the aim of Dickens to show the effect of the time and circumstance upon a character. It is not even his aim to show the effect of a character on time and circumstance. It is worth remark in passing that whenever he tried to describe change in a character, he made a mess of it, as in the repentance of Dombey or the apparent deterioration of Boffin. It was his aim to show character hung in a kind of happy void, in a world apart from time. Yes, and essentially apart from circumstance. Though the phrase may seem odd in connection with the godlike horseplay of Pickwick, but all the Pickwickian events, wild as they often are, were only designed to display the greater wildness of souls, or sometimes merely to bring the reader within touch, so to speak, of that wildness. The author would have fired Mr. Pickwick out of a cannon to get him to Wardle's by Christmas. He would have taken the roof off to drop him into Bob Sawyer's party. But once Pickwick at Wardle's, with his punch and a group of gorgeous personalities, and nothing will move him from his chair. Once he is at Sawyer's party, he forgets how he got there. He forgets Mrs. Bartle and all his story. For the story was but an incantation to call up a god, and the god, Mr. Jack Hopkins, is present in divine power. Once the great characters are face to face, the ladder by which they climb is forgotten and falls down. The structure of the story drops to pieces. The plot is abandoned. The other characters deserted at every kind of crisis. The whole crowd thoroughfare of the tale is blocked by two or three talkers who take their immortal ease as if they were already in paradise. For they do not exist for the story. The story exists for them, and they know it. To every man alive one must hope it has in some manner happened that he has talked with his more fascinating friends round a table on some night 
when all the numerous personalities unfolded themselves like great tropical flowers. All fell into their parts, as in some delightful impromptu play. Every man was more himself than he had ever been in this veil of tears. Every man was a beautiful caricature of himself. The man who has known such nights will understand the exaggerations of Pickwick. The man who has not known such nights will not enjoy Pickwick, nor, I imagine, heaven. For, as I have said, Dickens is, in this matter, close to popular religion, which is the ultimate and reliable religion. He conceives an endless joy. He conceives creatures as permanent as Puck or Pan, creatures whose will to live eons upon eons cannot satisfy. He has not come as a writer that his creatures may copy life and copy its narrowness. He has come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. It is absurd indeed that Christians should be called the enemies of life because they wish life to last forever. It is more absurd still to call the old comic writers dull because they wish their unchanging characters to last forever. Both popular religion with its endless joys and the old comic story with its endless jokes have in our time faded together. We are too weak to desire that undying vigor. We believe that you can have too much of a good thing, a blasphemous belief which at one blow wrecks all the heavens that men have hoped for. The grand old defiers of God were not afraid of an eternity of torment. We have come to be afraid of an eternity of joy. It is not my business here to take sides in this division between those who like life and long novels, and those who like death and short stories. My only business is to point out that those who see in Dickens's unchanging characters and recurring catchwords a mere stiffness and lack of living movement miss the point and nature of his work. His tradition is another tradition altogether. His aim is another aim altogether to those of the modern novelists who trace the alchemy of experience and the autumn tints of character. He is there, like the common people of all ages, to make deities. He is there, as I have said, to exaggerate life in the direction of life. The spirit he at bottom celebrates is that of two friends drinking wine together and talking through the night. But for him they are two deathless friends talking through an endless night and pouring wine from an exhaustible bottle. This, then, is the first firm fact to grasp about Pickwick. About Pickwick more than about any of the other stories. It is, first and foremost, a supernatural story. Mr. Pickwick was a fairy. So was old Mr. Weller. This does not imply that they were suited to swing in a trapeze of gossamer. It merely implies that if they had fallen out of it on their heads... They would not have died. But to speak more strictly, Mr. Samuel Pickwick is not the fairy. He is the fairy prince. That is to say, he is the abstract wanderer and wonderer, the Ulysses of comedy, the half-human and half-elven creature, human enough to wander, human enough to wonder, but still sustain with that merry fatalism that is natural to immortal beings sustained by that hint of divinity which tells him in the darkest hour that he is doomed to live happily ever afterwards. He has set out walking to the end of the world, but he knows he will find an inn there. And this brings us to the best and boldest element of originality in Pickwick. It has not, I think, been observed, and it may be that Dickens did not observe it. Certainly he did not plan it. It grew gradually perhaps out of the unconscious part of his soul, and warm the whole story like a slow fire. Of course it transformed the whole story also, transformed it out of all likeness to itself. About this latter point was waged one of the numberless little wars of Dickens. It was a part of his pugnacious vanity that he refused to admit the truth of the mildest criticism. Moreover, he used his inexhaustible ingenuity to find an apologia that was generally an afterthought. Instead of laughing and admitting an answer to criticism, the glorious improbability of Pecksniff, he retorted with a sneer, clever and very unjust, that he is not surprised that the Pecksniffs 
should deny the portrait of Pecksniff, when it was objected that the pride of old Paul Dombey breaks as abruptly as a stick, he tried to make out that there had been an absorbing psychological struggle going on in that gentleman all the time, which the reader was too stupid to perceive, which is, I am afraid, rubbish. And so, in a similar vein, he answered those who pointed out to him the obvious and not very shocking fact that our sentiments about Pickwick are very different in the second part of the book from our sentiments in the first, that we find ourselves at the beginning setting out in the company of a farcical old fool, if not a farcical old humbug, and that we find ourselves at the end saying farewell to a fine old England merchant, a monument of genial sanity. Dickens answered with the same ingenious self-justification as in other cases, that surely it often happened that a man met us first arrayed in his more grotesque qualities, and that fuller acquaintance unfolded his more serious merits. This, of course, is quite true, but I think an honest admirer of Pickwick will feel that is not an answer. For the fault in Pickwick, if it be a fault, is a change not in the hero, but in the whole atmosphere. The point is not that Pickwick turns into a different kind of man, it is that the Pickwick papers turns into a different kind of book. And however artistic both parts may be, this combination must, in strict art, be called inartistic. A man is quite artistically justified in writing a tale in which a man as cowardly as Bob Akers becomes a man as brave as Hector. A man is quite artistically justified in writing a tale in which a man as cowardly as Bob Akers becomes a man as brave as Hector. But a man is not artistically justified in writing a tale which begins in the style of the rivals and ends in the style of the Iliad. In other words, we do not mind the hero changing in the course of a book, but we are not prepared for the author changing in the course of the book. And the author did change in the course of this book. He made, in the midst of this book, a great discovery, which was a discovery of his destiny, or, what is more important, of his duty. That discovery turned him from the author of Sketches by Boz to the author of David Copperfield. And that discovery constituted the thing of which I have spoken, the outstanding and arresting original feature in the Pickwick Papers. Pickwick, I have said, is a romance of adventure, and Samuel Pickwick is the romantic adventurer. So much is indeed obvious, but the strange and stirring discovery which Dickens made was this, that having chosen a fat old man of the middle classes as a good thing of which to make a butt, he found that a fat old man of the middle classes is the very best thing of which to make a romantic adventurer. Pickwick is supremely original in that it is the adventures of an old man. It is a fairy tale in which the victor is not the youngest of the three brothers, but one of the oldest of their uncles. The result is both noble and new and true. There is nothing which so much needs simplicity as adventure, but there is no one who so much possesses simplicity as an honest and elderly man of business. For romance he is better than a troop of young troubadours, for the swaggering young fellow anticipates his adventures, just as he anticipates his income. Hence, both the adventures and the income, when he comes up to them, are not there. But a man in late middle age has grown used to the plain necessities, and his first holiday is a second youth. A good man, as Thackeray said, with such thorough and searching truth, grows simpler as he grows older. Samuel Pickwick, in his youth, was probably an insufferable young coxcomb. He knew then, or thought he knew, all about the confident tricks of swindlers like Jingle. He knew then, or thought he knew, all about the amatory designs of sly ladies like Mrs. Bardell. But years and real life have relieved him of this idle and evil knowledge. He has had the high good luck, and losing the follies of youth, to lose the wisdom of youth also. Dickens has caught, in a manner at once wild and convincing, 
this queer innocence of the afternoon of life the round moonlike face the round moonlike spectacles of samuel pickwick move through the tale as emblems of a certain spherical simplicity they are fixed in that grave surprise that may be seen in babies that grave surprise which is the only real happiness that is possible to man pickwick's round face is like a round and honourable mirror in which are reflected all the fantasies of earthly existence for surprise is strictly speaking the only kind of reflection all this grew gradually on dickens it is odd to recall to our minds the original plan the plan of the nimrod club and the author who was to be wholly occupied in playing practical jokes on his characters he had chosen or somebody else had chosen that corpulent old simpleton as a person peculiarly fitted to fall down trap doors to shoot over butter slides to struggle with apple pie beds to be tipped out of carts and dipped into horse ponds but dickens and dickens only discovered as he went on how fitted that fat old man was to rescue ladies to defy tyrants to dance to leap to experiment with life to be a do e machina and even a knight errant dickens made this discovery dickens went into the pickwick club to scoff and dickens remained to pray moliere and his marquis are very much amused when Monsieur Jourdain, the fat old middle-class fellow, discovers with delight that he has been talking prose all his life. I have often wondered whether Moliere saw how, in this fact, Monsieur Jourdain towers above them all and touches the stars. He has the freshness to enjoy a fresh fact, the freshness to enjoy even an old one. He can feel that the common thing prose is an accomplishment like verse, and it is an accomplishment like verse, it is the miracle of language. He can feel the subtle taste of water and roll it on his tongue like wine. His simple vanity and veracity, his innocent love of living, his ignorant love of learning, are things far fuller of romance than the weariness and foppishness of the sniggering cavaliers. When he consciously speaks prose, he unconsciously thinks poetry. It would be better for us all if we were as conscious that supper is supper, or that life is life, as his true romantic was that prose is actually prose. Monsieur Jourdain is here the type. Mr. Pickwick is elsewhere the type of this true and neglected thing, the romance of the middle classes. It is the custom in our little epoch to sneer at the middle classes. Cockney artists profess to find the bourgeoisie dull, as if artists had any business to find anything dull. Decadents talk contemptuously of its conventions and its set tasks. It never occurs to them that conventions and set tasks are the very way to keep the greenness in the grass and the redness in the roses, which they have lost forever. Stevenson, in his incomparable Lantern Bearers, describes the ecstasy of a schoolboy in the mere fact of buttoning a dark lantern under a dark gray coat. If you wish for that ecstasy of the schoolboy, you must have the boy, but you must also have the school. Strict opportunities and defined hours are the very outline of that enjoyment. A man like Mr. Pickwick has been at school all of his life, and when he comes out he astonishes the youngsters. His heart as that acute psychologist Mr. Weller points out, had been born later than his body. It will be remembered that Mr. Pickwick also, when on the escapade of Winkle and Miss Ellen, took immoderate pleasure in the performances of a dark lantern, which was not dark enough, and was nothing but a nuisance to everybody. His soul also was with Stevenson's boys on the grey sands of Haddington, talking in the dark by the sea he was also of the league of the lantern bearers stevenson i remember says that in the shops of that town they could purchase penny pickwicks that remarkable cigar let us hope they smoked them and that the rotund ghost of pickwick hovered over the rings of smoke pickwick goes through life with that godlike gullibility which is the key to all adventures the greenhorn is the ultimate victor in everything it is he that gets the most out of life, 
because Pickwick is led away by Jingle. He would be led to the White Hart Inn, and see the only weather cleaning boots in the courtyard. Because he is bamboozled by Dodson and Fogg, he will enter the prison house like a paladin and rescue the man and the woman who have wronged him most. His soul will never starve for exploits or excitements, who is wise enough to be made a fool of. He will make himself happy in the traps that have been laid for him. He will roll in their nets and sleep. All doors will fly open to him who has a mildness more defiant than mere courage. The whole is unerringly expressed in one fortunate phrase. He will be always taken in. To be taken in everywhere is to see the insight of everything. It is the hospitality of circumstance. With torches and trumpets, like a guest, the greenhorn is taken in by life, and the skeptic is cast out by it. End of chapter 4